Are we ready? Ready? Okay. So, um, today's the last lecture. Um, I don't have enough time to prove GRH. So I'm gonna <laughs> so I'm gonna show you some some applications or an app. I'll discuss more than one application, but I want to kind of give you some flavor for how you actually use it um, in an example. So um, because of the amount of detail, I kind of pre-wrote my slides, so maybe I'll kind of point along the way. Um, okay. So this is a reminder of where we started. Um, at the top, if we have a primitive Dirichlet character, modulus m, m is at least three. The only characters of modulus one and two are trivial, and we're interested in non-trivial characters. Um, and so the completed L function is given by, see the modulus shows up, the power of pi over m, s or s plus one over two with the minus sign, the gamma, two variants, and the L function, depending on, as often, the chi is even or odd. That's about whether chi is minus one is is one. So two of my markers dried out as I was writing these. So you're going to see a rainbow of colors on the different pages here. Um, and so the point is that if chi is a non-trivial primitive character, then the completed L function is entire. Having a pole is kind of illustrative of the uh, trivial character, the zeta function. The other ones don't have poles. And this distinction really is often a source of a number of theoretic theorems. So before we discuss applications of the generalized Riemann hypothesis, how do you test the generalized Riemann hypothesis um, in a particular example? So we, I mentioned before for the Riemann zeta function that zeta of 1 half plus it doesn't behave particularly interestingly on the critical line, but the completed zeta function by the functional equation, that's fe, by the functional equation we saw the uh, completed Riemann zeta function is real valued on the critical line, so you can detect zeros with sign changes. You have two methods. You can use the argument principle, integrating the log derivative around the box, and uh, you can use the real valuedness down the middle to find sign changes, and if the two counts match, you've verified the Riemann hypothesis up to that height of the box, and at the same time, actually check that the roots are all simple, which is what we expect. Um, and so, the extension of this to uh, the completed Dirichlet L function has a slight twist, namely the, uh, by the functional equation for the completed Dirichlet L functions, it's not the case that they are themselves real valued on the critical line, but uh, if you take the functional equation, I mentioned it has the form, the completed guy of S attached to chi is equal to the completed guy for chi bar, the conjugate character at one minus S, Equality up to a number of magnitude one called the root number. It was the Gauss sum of chi divided by root m or i root m, some number of absolute value one, not a function of s. And um, if you were to just call the root number, if you pick a square root, pick a number or u of chi that squares to the root number, so it's determined up to, up to a plus or minus sign. If you divide the completed L function by either of your choices for the square root, just stick with it. Um, this ratio will be real valued on the critical line. You can use the functional equation um, right here to, to verify that this expression at one minus, at one half plus it is invariant under conjugation. So you can play the same game of using the argument principle or looking for sign changes on the critical line. Hope they match. We expect all the zeros are simple zeros. And remember for the completed guy and the original L function, the zeros in the critical strip are the same numbers with the same multiplicities with real parts strictly between 0 and 1. And so testing for one of these L of S chi or lambda of S chi is the same thing, but the completed one has the nicer real value property. So in principle, this is how you would verify it. In practice, you could run into the problem that this nice real value function might be extraordinarily small, so you might need to do some normalizations by real value positive quantities kind of amplify the size to detect sign changes more easily. But in principle, we see here, in argument principle, we see uh, two ways to, well, you get what you pay for. We, uh, you, you see two ways to, um, uh, to approach the count of the zeros. And so this is basically how you can verify it. Okay. Um, I've never actually gone through it myself, but this is what they say. 
So um, let me tell you about an example of using a general Riemann hypothesis. Um, it's not the main, main problem for today, but it's an interesting illustration of the role that it's played. So it's called the ternary Goldbrock problem. I'm going to call it here TG. It's not a standard abbreviation, but you can see where it came from. So the, the claim of the ternary, not the usual Goldbach conjecture, is every even number, at least four, is the sum of two primes. And the ternary Goldbach problem, every odd number, at least seven, is the sum of three primes. Um, doesn't work at five, so seven is the natural starting point. So um, the progress on this, this is now a settled problem. Power Health got verified a few years ago. This is true, but look at the progress. So in the 1920s, it was shown that this is correct for all sufficiently large odd uh, integers, assuming that all Dirichlet L functions are non-zero with real part greater than or equal to three quarters. Okay, that they're non-zero to the right of three quarters, technically to the right of a little bit to the left of three quarters. So any number a little bit to the left of three quarters, if you know that there were no zeros to the right of that, then uh, they could verify that this claim um, is valid for all really large, sufficiently large odd n. Um, so of course the general Germanic hypothesis says all the zeros should have real part of half. And so that certainly would fit this condition that they're non-zero to the right of three quarters minus your favorite small epsilon, all of them at the same time. You're using essentially all of them, or certainly infinitely many of them. Um, now, over time, it was shown that you could get the same conclusion for sufficiently large numbers without any unproved at the time hypotheses. Okay? Um, now, these sufficiently large ends where things kick in were not computable by these authors, although later people found, okay, you can make it effective, but the end where it provably kicks in is like, you know, 10 to the, you know, hundreds or something. So it's not anything that's feasible. You can't just directly verify the condition up to the bound beyond which these, this theorem becomes applicable. But if you march ahead 60 years, we uh, find that the full claim of the ternary Goldbach wound up being a consequence of the generalized Riemann hypothesis for all Dirichlet L functions. Um, I don't think, I should have checked, I don't think that they were able to get by with a weaker version, but in any case, if you, um, using GRH, the whole thing is a consequence, but at the time that this was shown, of course, GRH was still an open problem, so this is not, it's a theorem, but it's not an unconditional theorem. It depends on a hypothesis at the time, and uh, if you go ahead, though, uh, to 2013, Harold Helfgott was able to remove that uh, hypothesis from 1997. Um, and so this is often what happens. The general Riemann hypothesis is a guide to what ought to be true. Okay? So people prove many things assuming the general Riemann hypothesis, and then later on, if you don't know if it's true, then people say, well, let me try to get that result without assuming that it's a guide to what ought to be worth trying to show. It tells us which way things should go. Um, now, with this in mind, I want to point out that there are functions very much like the zeta function, like the Dirichlet L functions, which, when I say like, I mean they, they start off as certain series that look like them. They have functional equations, but they don't satisfy the general Riemann hypothesis. Let me tell you about some of those. So here's an example of the failure of the... Uh, Generalized Riemann hypothesis. Let me hide, hide that. There we go. Okay. So a failure of generalized Riemann hypothesis. This was a result of Davenport and Heilbronn following upon work of um, some earlier British mathematicians. Um, so if you let Q be a binary quadratic form, AX plus BXY plus CY squared, the A, B, and C are integers, and the discriminant, B squared minus 4C, is negative. The standard example is X squared plus Y squared. Or x squared plus 2y squared, x squared plus 3y squared, x squared plus 5y squared. They all have negative discriminant. That makes the values positive. We call these positive definite quadratic forms. They're positive away from, of course, 0, 0. And we can take, as a Dirichlet series, the sum of the reciprocal s powers of qxy as xy run over the integer pairs. The prime means don't include 0, 0. Okay, aside from that, sum over those values to the s power. This will converge for a real part bigger than one. 
And so this is sort of like a two-dimensional analog of the Riemann zeta function. Um, so it can be shown that this series extends to the whole complex plane, not by this formula, but um, like we saw with the Riemann zeta function, you can find other formulas. Um, you can extend it to the whole complex plane, and you uh, get a simple pole at one. Otherwise, it's analytic, so it looks very much like the Riemann zeta function. And if you complete it, by multiplying by gamma of s, not s over 2, gamma of s, 2 pi to the minus s. Is, where is this coming from? I mean, there is a, a general understanding of where these factors come from, which we don't have time to get into. And then the absolute value of d to the s over 2. So this is reminiscence of um, what I wrote before, pi over m to the minus s over 2. That, that really is m to the s over 2, pi to the minus s over 2. So you see that that feature there is, is showing up here. The D is the discriminant in absolute value because it's negative. And this completed version of this series is uh, analytic on the pole plane, except uh, this is actually analytic on the whole plane, except for, uh, I guess, poles at 0 and 1. And it has this nice functional equation. And it can even be shown that there are infinitely many zeros on the critical line. The zeta and Dirichlet L functions are known to have infinitely many zeros on the critical line. And here's the surprise. If the field Q adjoined root D has a class number bigger than 1, which has been discussed, the class number has been discussed in the lectures in arithmetic statistics, in the lectures in algebraic number theory, if this field, which is an imaginary quadratic field, D is negative, um, if the class number is bigger than 1, then this series, in fact, has infinitely many zeros with real part bigger than 1. So a pretty strong violation of the generalized Riemann hypothesis. So what's an example of an imaginary quadratic field that has come up that has class number bigger than one in either of the other courses. You ever seen class number two? <coughs> huh? What? Q root minus minus one. Minus one. Ooh. Q root minus one has what? what? You want to re you redeem yourself? Uh, minus four. No, Q root minus four is the same as Q root minus one. Oh, sorry. Minus five. Minus five. Right? Minus 5. Q root minus 5 is the first imaginary quadratic field with, um, with class number bigger than 1. So let's take a quadratic form where the discriminant, let's, let's look at x squared plus 5y squared. The discriminant is minus 20. Q root minus 20 is the same as Q root minus 5. Class number is 2. And so here's a table I found on the internet. Um, which is a plot of the z location in the upper half plane, real part bigger than zero. Notice the scale here. Here we're from zero to one, and this is 500. So this is not, this is not a one to yeah. Okay. Um, anyway, and so you can see there are tons of zeros with real part bigger than a half. And if here's the line one. There's even a little blip there, real part bigger than one. So, I mean, this sounds very counterintuitive. It's like, how can there be a zero with real part bigger than one? Because doesn't that violate the Euler product? Well, I never said that there was an Euler product. Okay? We didn't need, we didn't use the Euler product to get the analytic continuation Riemann zeta function after all. We just used the series. We wrote it as an integral, use the theta function. So you can get analytic continuation without an Euler product. And in some sense, this this plethora of zeros of real part bigger than one suggests this thing should not have any, and there is not known to be any natural Euler product for these kinds of series. So in a certain sense, many people believe the Euler product should be some kind of essential ingredient in any type of a Dirichlet series of analytic continuation and functional equations for which one should expect a Riemann-type hypothesis to be satisfied. So we have lots of examples of imagine, all imaginary quadratic fields with nine exceptions have class number bigger than one. So we have lots of examples of series that have many properties that look like the Riemann zeta function, but they don't, definitely don't satisfy the Riemann hypothesis. They don't have an Euler product, though, so we shouldn't be too surprised that these things happen. Okay. Um, let me tell you about another example of, the, um, of a consequence. I mentioned the ternary Goldbach problem. So there's another interesting example of a nice concrete uh, consequence of the generalized Riemann hypothesis, and this is called uh, Artin's primitive root conjecture. Okay, so the starting point here is that 
For every prime p, the non-zero numbers mod p form a cyclic group. So we can ask, if I take an integer, does it not divisible by p, does it generate the full group? Is it a generator of the full group of numbers mod p, non-zero numbers mod p, um, infinitely often? For example, take the number 10. Gauss, in some sense, thought about this because he was looking at the period length of a unit fraction, 1 over n, the decimal period length, if n is not divisible by 2 or 5, the decimal period length of 1 over n is the order of 10 mod n. And so you can ask the period length of 1 over n is always at most n minus 1, and it achieves the value n minus 1 at least, at best, only if n is a prime. The converse might not be true. Um, and so looking for, instance, when 10 mod p generates all the numbers mod p, is basically looking at primes where 1 over p has decimal period length p minus 1, the biggest it could, might possibly be. So um, for which integers might this happen infinitely often that a is a generator of infinitely many of these groups? So it definitely doesn't happen for minus 1. Minus 1 is a generator mod 3, and that's it. Oh, I'm sorry, minus 1 is a generator mod 2. Okay? And that's it. Okay? Because, of course, it has order 2 for any higher prime. If A is a perfect square, it can't generate the non-zero numbers mod P unless P is 2. Okay? Perfect square um, is never a generator. And so Art and conjecture that these are the only exceptions. Every integer that is not minus 1 and not a perfect square will generate the non-zero numbers mod P infinitely often. And in fact, um, there will be a definite positive proportion of such primes. The number of primes up to X for which A is a generator of the numbers mod P out of the number, total number of primes up to X has a definite positive limit. And quite often, um, it's given by the limiting density is given by this, uh, this value. So let me, let, me, let me denote this as delta A of X. The density of primes up to X that make A mod P a generator of the numbers mod P. And this density often has the value given by this infinite product um, which is around 0.37. Um, and um, Hooley showed that if you use the general Adriemann hypothesis, not for the Dirichlet L functions, but for the zeta functions of number fields, those taking algebraic, the algebraic number theory course, if we already know it, this is the zeta function of a number field, is the sum over the ideals, non-zero ideals, one over the norm of the ideal, it's an integer to the s power. So if k is the rationals, this is the sum over positive integers of one over n to the s. So this generalizes the Riemann zeta function to all number fields. It converges to the real power bigger than one. It has a functional equation. It's expected to satisfy the generalized Riemann hypothesis. And um, anyway, if you assume the generalized Riemann hypothesis, then um, I mean he needed he needed this for infinitely many number fields, certain Coomer extensions of Q that were related to the number a that you're working with. And so this is an instance where although um, yeah, where this, this was shown to follow. So anyone who proves the general Riemann hypothesis will prove this result. You see, this is not yet known. For, well, without GRH, this, nobody knows how to verify that this is true for any number at all. Okay, we can't say that without GRH that this is true for two. Although the data looks pretty good. Okay? Um, although it is known without GRH that this property is true for one of the numbers, A equals 2, 3, or 5. But we, without GRH, you can't point to one of them and say it's true for that one. Okay? But for at least one of those, it's true unconditionally, meaning without using GRH. We use GRH, you know, you get the whole thing. Um, but without GRH, nobody knows how to show it for any one individual example. So let me show you some data. So here's how the uh, densities behave as x runs through the, uh, the powers of 10. So Harris helped me do these calculations. Um, so for example, you know, around 37% um, of integers up to 10 million have 2 as a generator mod p, or 3 as a generator mod p, or, and so on. Now you look at this data, does anything strike you as peculiar? Huh? The last two rules. What about the last two? They're the same? 
Five, look at five compared to the others. It seems to be stubbornly clinging to around 0.39 compared to the others. So in fact, um, the ex yeah, so the, the, the value of this limit using GRH is not that common value that was around 0.373 that I told you before, but rather 20 nineteenths that common value. And that's, that's around 0.39, okay? So, um, so the density is, is not always given by this kind of common formula. There's something funny that happens. A has certain prime factors that are one mod four. Um, but in any case, um, and this, this distinction was discovered by um, Artin and the Lamers numerically um, and so Artin had to fix his original conjecture. He first thought that this density was the same all the time. And there was, oops, the data suggests a mistake, and he fixed it. Um, anyway, okay, so um, what I would like to do for the rest of today is try to work through some ideas of using the general Riemann hypothesis to uh, discuss this goal that I mentioned yesterday, which is that if you have the general Riemann hypothesis, then there is some number k that make all proper subgroups of all unit groups mod m miss a number that's below k log m squared. Okay. So if you had a subgroup of this that contained all the numbers up to k log m squared, it would have to be everything. So if you have a proper subgroup, it has to miss a number below this amount. Okay. So at first, it seems like a rather strange thing to care about, but it's quite relevant, for example, various um, algorithms, or for instance, primality tests, depend on, to be in polynomial time, um, depend on something like that. For example, uh, we have the famous Fermat test, which tells us if you have a modulus m and you ever get, you ever get a to the m minus 1, not 1 mod m for some a in this range, Certainly, M cannot be a prime, because if M were a prime, this would be 1 all the time. And so you might say, well, I can prove a number is composite by breaking the congruence, by making this not 1. And you might say, well, let me just try A equals 1. Well, you're not going to break it when A is 1. Let me try A equals 2. You often find it breaks when A is 2, if M is an odd composite number. But sporadically, you don't break it at 2, then try 3, 4. So you might ask, if M is composite, how far up do I have to go to break this congruence. Well, unfortunately, sometimes you might find it very hard to break the congruence if, if you're dealing with what are called Carmichael numbers, which exist and are infinitely many of them, but it's quite rare. Um, but if we ignore Carmichael numbers, um, then um, a number that's not a Carmichael number and is composite has the set of numbers that make the power equal to one a proper subgroup. See, the, the A's mod M that make this power equal to 1 are a subgroup. Product of two A's, inverse of such an A is again such an A, concerning the numbers mod M. And so if you are dealing with an M that's not a Carmichael number and is composite, this is a proper subgroup of the full unit group mod M. And so you would then ask, well, how far do I have to check in order to find something outside of this subgroup? Okay. And the answer would be, if you use a general Riemann hypothesis, you don't have to check very far. Okay? Of course, assuming you can find a value for k. If k is 2, that's good. If k is 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 34, it's not so useful. Um, it's just a theoretical result. But um, in any case, we want to see what such a value of k turns out to be. And while the Fermat test is not really um, an airtight test, because there are Carmichael numbers that make it very hard to uh, find counterexamples to this congruence, there are refinements of the Fermat test, the Miller-Raven test, the solovay strassen test, which have the witnesses to the compositeness um, lie outside of a certain subgroup that's demonstrably a proper subgroup if n is composite. So they have n nothing like Carmichael numbers to screw them up. Okay? And so, uh, so there, and there are various other situations where um, trying to generate a numerical algorithm to find a witness for some property amounts trying to find a number outside of a proper subgroup of the units mod m in some example. And so GRH is telling us 
you don't have to look very far to find a number outside of a given subgroup if the subgroup is a proper subgroup. So how would you verify something like this? Are there any questions? Yes, sir. Is there any Carmichael numbers? Yes, good question. So in 1994, um, um, yeah, it was proved by uh, Granville, Pomerantz, and Red Alford that there were infill many Carmichael numbers. At the same time, they're really quite rare. I mean, the first one is 561. The next one is 1105. Um, the third one is 1729, the Ramanujan taxi cab number. Okay. Don't ask me what the fourth, well, you can ask me what the fourth one is, but I won't tell you, because I don't know. Um, so in any case, yes, yeah, so the Carmichael numbers are, in theory, an obstruction to making the Fermat test an airtight compositeness or primality test. Other questions? Okay. So yeah, how do you get this constant? How do you compute it? How do you, how do you deal with you know, proper subgroups and all this stuff? Okay. So the first thing that you do is nothing to do with analysis. It's a little piece of algebra. Um, the first thing that you do is, it turns out, especially if you know about linear algebra, if you know about linear algebra, the, you know, talking about proper subgroups is like in linear algebra, talking about proper subspaces. So if you have a proper subgroup of the units mod M, there will always be a Dirichlet character mod M, which that subgroup lies in its kernel. Okay, this is sort of like, if you know about like dual spaces, if you have a proper subspace of a vector space, there's always some linear functional that's zero on the subspace that's not zero on the whole space. Um, and so it's sort of like that. But in any case, all subgroups that are proper lie in the kernel of a non-trivial, non-trivial, I mean, the trivial character certainly contains everything in its kernel. Um, so there's a non-trivial character um, whose kernel contains that, and the kernel will then be a proper subgroup itself. So if you're trying to find an integer below some k log m squared outside of h, well, if you're going to be able to do that in general, then you have to find, then there, there ought to be a number outside of the kernel of chi um, that's less than or equal to k log m squared. And so, and so if I can find a number that's outside of this proper subgroup, then it's outside of this proper subgroup. So it suffices to prove this theorem to reach the goal just with subgroups of the form kernel of a character. Okay. The next step is that if you had a character, mod m, that came from a character mod some factor of m, meaning this character is a result of reducing to some smaller factor and then applying some character of that modulus, well, let's think about it. Suppose you knew the result for characters to this modulus. Namely, there has to be a positive integer below k log m prime squared in which this character is not one. That very same number is at most k log m squared, because m prime is a factor of m, so this bound is below that bound. And this character can't be one on that number, because if the character were one, if this character were one on the number, then the number is prime to m. And so by the meaning of this character coming from this, this value is the reduction followed by this value. And so chi of a and chi prime of a reduced mod m prime are equal. And so uh, since chi prime of a is not 1, if chi of a were 1, you'd run into a contradiction. And so if the goal is attainable, it really suffices to prove it just for the characters that don't come from smaller modulus characters. In other words, we can focus on primitive characters. So we only have to worry about the primitive case. Okay, so we're going to focus our attention on a primitive character. We would like to show that there's a positive number so that for every modulus at least three and every primitive character that, um, remember, we can focus here on the subgroups of the form kernel of a character. And so we want to show that there has to be a positive integer below some k, some k log m squared, for which chi of a is not one meaning it's not in the subgroup kernel of chi. Could it happen otherwise? Could you have a character that's one on all the numbers? Uh, excuse me, given a character, could you have it equal to one on all the numbers in some range? And you know, would you really run into a problem? So we'd like to show that if you had a primitive character that was one on all the numbers in some range, 
I want to bound how far out you can do that by some number times log n squared, some universal number times log n squared. Hmm. So the basic idea is if your character were equal to 1 over a long range of numbers, think about the L function, think about the zeta function. If the character were equal to 1 for a long range of numbers, these coefficients are equal to these coefficients for an initial chunk. And so intuitively, this function looks like that function. Now, you're going to have a problem because this is a pole and this does not. Okay, we have a primitive character to a modulus bigger than or equal to 3. It's non-trivial. So you might expect to run into a problem. You might also expect that intuition sounds hard to convert into something you can do anything with because you're only talking about some initial chunk of numbers, you know, numbers below m. So how do you really make this intuition that, uh, precise that these ought to look the same? But they can't be the same because one has a pole and one doesn't. So the idea is to take both functions and apply a certain integral transform to them that extracts out just an initial chunk of the coefficients on both sides. So, any questions? Okay. I mean, I'll post notes about this later, so I'm just, I'm just let it, let the ideas wash over you. So, let me give you an example of an integral transform which allows us to extract out the initial coefficients of the Dirichlet series. So, here's an example of this. So, this is a result due to Perron. And it might look at first like a weird result. So what it's saying, this has nothing to do with Dirichlet series here. What it's saying is if you integrate positive x, positive c, this is a vertical integral. You're integrating along a vertical line okay, in the right half plane. If you integrate x to the s over s, 1 over 2 pi i, if x is between 0 and 1, the integral is 0. If x is bigger than 1, the integral is 1. And if x is 1, well, the integral is a half. So it's kind of a discontinuous formula. Um, and this is proved using the residue theorem often. You, know, you chop off the top and the bottom of the vertical integration, and then you build a box where that's that, that vertical segment is either the left end of the box or the right end of the box, and arranged so that on the other end of the box, this expression should be small. So if x is between 0 and 1, on the other end of the box, I want s to have a big real part. And if x is bigger than 1, I want the other end of the box to have a negative real part. So it kind of tells you on which side to make that the side of the box, the right side and the left side, so the other side. And you pray and hope on the tops and bottoms also. Everything goes to 0 as the width and then the height of the boxes go to, uh, go to infinity. Um, and so the way you can apply this is as follows. If you had a Dirichlet series, say converging for real part bigger than 1, like the examples of the L functions and the Riemann zeta function, then if you do this kind of integral transform on f of s, x to the s over s, well, you have an integral of a sum times a number, and so you swap the order, summation and integration, you bring out the sum, you bring out the coefficient, you put in the 1 over 2 pi r, you put in the integral, and then the a n over n to the s, you take the a n outside, and on the inside you have x to the s over n to the s, so you just put it together as one term. And now you have something to which you can apply Perron's formula with x over n in place of x. So we're interested in the case when this thing here is equal to 1 or greater than 1, meaning n is equal to x or less than x. So when that happens, this expression is 1, unless you're at the end point if x is an integer, in which case it's a half. And so what you get at the end is everything dies off except the terms where x over n is greater than or equal to 1. In other words, where n is less than or equal to x. And when you do that, you're just left with a n times 1, unless x is an integer. And at the very end of the sum, you have to put a n times a half. And so this little funny star just means you weight the last term with a 1 half. It's a n over 2 if x is an integer. And if it isn't, forget it. Don't worry about it. All right? So we get here a formula from this Dirichlet series that only knows the initial chunk of the coefficients. Okay? So, for example, if you had another Dirichlet series and its coefficients were the same as the coefficients of f of s up to that range, then if you do this calculation, and you do this calculation, you're going to get exactly the same thing because this expression depends only on the initial chunk of the coefficients. And so this is the idea. 
if you have two Dirichlet series whose initial coefficients look the same, if you apply some kind of integral transform like this, then you're going to get a result that doesn't depend on what the function was if you have two of these series with the same initial coefficients. And then if you can calculate these two integrals in another way, like use the residue theorem on them, you get two expressions that have to be equal because these two things are equal. So this is not the kind of integral transform that turns out to be useful for our purposes, but it's really the most basic example. So I want to show you how this, how you can go from here to here, something that only remembers the initial chunk of the coefficients. So we get this nice principle, equal coefficients in a range leads to equal integral transforms involving the whole function on a vertical line. So what we're going to use instead of this is something where we put s squared instead of s. Actually, not s squared. We'll do s plus a parameter squared. So here is what we're actually going to use. If you integrate along a vertical line in the right half plane, positive number, with s plus b squared, b is some number bigger than 0. We'll pre I'll tell you what it is later. If you integrate this in x is between 0 and 1, it's 0. And if x is bigger than or equal to 1, it turns out to be log x over x to the b. And the nice thing about this, I'm not saying this is, I mean, you calculate a residue of this, um, and, and you get out this value. This is a double pole at minus b. So it's a little bit trickier than the previous example. Um, the thing about this is notice when x is 1 that they match. So when x is 1, this is also 0. So it's a little bit nicer than the previous example, because this is actually continuous in x. No jump, no funny jumps. Um, and so if you were going to apply this to a Dirichlet series, say it converges to the right of 1, then you're going to integrate to the right of 1, and let's say x is bigger than 1, um, and if you do this integration, then again, you swap the integral with the sum, you bring out the sum, you bring out the coefficient, and then the x to the s over n to the s is x over n to the s, and this thing, by this formula, only is significant when the thing you're taking powers of is at least 1, x over n at least 1, n is less than or equal to x. And so what you get then is this wacky formula, log x over n over x over n to the b, where n is at most x. And so this thing only knows the coefficients up to x. And so I'm not saying this looks like some kind of nasty thing, but it only depends on the original Dirichlet series up through the coefficients with n up to x. And so therefore, if I apply this to the zeta function, and I apply to the Dirichlet L function, then I would get the same value if chi of n is equal to 1 for n up to x. However, when you're working with the Riemann zeta function or Dirichlet L functions, you don't necessarily always use the zeta function or the L function directly. What you often use is the logarithmic derivatives because, as I think I mentioned in the first lecture, if you logarithmically differentiate a function, 1 over f, f prime, the multiplicity of a zero becomes a residue. Okay? Um, and so very often we use the logarithmic derivative of a function instead of the function itself. And so this is what we actually would apply this to. If your character is 1 for some range, I'm going to contemplate the integral of a function times x to the s over s plus b squared for the log derivative of the zeta function with a minus sign and the log derivative of the L function with a minus sign. And this comes from the, if you use the Euler product, the Euler product of the zeta function and the Euler product of the Dirichlet L function let you write the logarithmic derivative as a Dirichlet series. The product over primes, when you logarithmically differentiate, becomes a sum over prime powers. And so with the Riemann zeta function, the, log, the negative log derivative is this mysterious thing. And for the negative log derivative of the Dirichlet L function, it's this, where you insert the character at the prime powers in the coefficients. And so if you have your, co your Dirichlet character equal to 1 at all the numbers up to x, so in particular at prime powers it's equal to 1, for all the prime powers up to x, then if you apply this transform to this and to this, 
you will get the same answer because these things only remember the coefficients of these series over the indices up to x. And so if this is 1 for inputs up to x, even though these don't look like the same function, um, these integral transforms will actually have the same value. And so this is kind of the key point. Notice I'm not writing what they are actually equal to. That would involve this mysterious mess right here. I don't care. All I want is that this thing only depends on the coefficients up to x, where the x here is the x up here. And so if this and this have coefficients that match up to x, then this is equal to this. Okay, great. What can I do with this? I can now try to calculate both sides independently using the residue theorem on this side and on this side. And there's going to be a huge difference. Huge difference is this thing has a pole at 1, and this thing does not. And so when we calculate the residues, this is going to have an extra term that's not coming on this side. And that's going to let us bound how big x could be. Okay? Any questions? So there's a lot of detailed calculations. Just give me you sit and watch it. <gasps> okay? So I'm just going to give you a kind of a broad overview of what's happening here. I mean, I have kind of like, you know, probably like 20 pages of calculations. I'm not going to present them here. Nobody wants to see that stuff. Um, so from the hypothesis that the character is 1 all the way up to x, I would hope to bound how big x could be. From this property, I get that these two expressions for any b bigger than 0 and any c bigger than 1 have to be the same. And so I'm going to kind of like fix the value of b eventually and then try to compare. So let's see what happens. So we're going to calculate these integrals using the residue theorem. So let me put up here what uh, the functions. There are the two functions. And so, well, I guess I'm going to hide it up here. OK. So we're going to compute the integrals in a second way using the residue theorem. So there are the integrals. There are the integrals right there. Okay, that is equal to that. So let me try to calculate the residues. of it. I have to find the poles of this and then find the residues. So it turns out for, for, for this function, well, look, it clearly is going to have a double pole at minus b. Oh, so let me now take b, say, to be between 0 and 1, okay? Because we know the Riemann zeta function, it is going to have a pole. A logarithmic derivative has a pole where the original function has a 0 or pole. And this sucker has no zeros on the real line between 0 and 1. So for any number between 0 and 1, I'll use that for b. So this will have a double pole at minus b. It's going to have a pole at 1 because the zeta function has a pole at 1. It's going to have a pole at negative even numbers because zeta has a 0 at negative even numbers. So the log derivative is a pole at negative even numbers. And it's going to have a pole at the non-trivial zeros of the zeta function because where a function has its zeros, it's a logarithmic derivative has poles. Remember I, I mentioned before, if a function looks like c s minus a to the m plus dot dot dot, the logarithmic derivative, 1 over ff prime, looks like m over s minus a plus dot, dot, dot. Right? Zeros and poles turn into simple poles with residue equal to the multiplicity. The leading coefficient cancels out. And so we have a double pole of this thing, a simple pole at 1, a simple pole at negative even numbers, and a simple pole at the non-trivial zeros. We don't know... We don't have even the Riemann hypothesis. As long as we don't know that, we don't even know what the multiplicities are. Okay? We think that all the zeros are simple, but we don't know for the zeta function. With the logarithmic derivative of the zeta function, we know all of its poles at the non-trivial zeros of zeta have to be simple. Right? Look. All right? um, the residue is the mysterious multiplicities. So if you calculate the residues of this function, at that number, you get mess. At 1, you get that. This is coming from the pole of the zeta function. The negative even integers, you get some other expression. And at the non-zero, non-trivial zeros of the zeta function, essentially you plug in to the number, and then you get your, uh, your value here. This m is the multiplicity of the zero, which you think should always be 1 for the Riemann zeta function. We don't know that. So anyway, you can write down residue formulas. And for the uh, other side, for the other side of this thing, you get a double pole at minus b. You get a simple pole at the trivial zeros 
of the L function, either the negative even numbers together with zero or the negative odd numbers. And you also get from this expression, you get poles of this from zeros, I'll write them as rho chi, zeros of the Dirichlet L function. And these are simple poles of this function. These are simple poles. And because zeros and poles of the L function become simple poles both of the, in both cases for the logarithmic derivative, and you get a double pole at minus b. What you don't see here is 1. This does not have a pole at 1. That behaves well at 1, and that behaves well at 1. L function doesn't vanish at 1. Okay? So this page here is missing an entry that we had in the other example. And so you can work out residue formulas, mess, formula, formula. It looks pretty much the same, right? If you look at the, look at the residue formulas, let me just kind of put these next to each other here, right? You can see that things, I mean, it's some log derivative, derivative of the log derivative, ugh, okay? But otherwise, it's, the calculations are all very similar, okay? Um, and so, but the thing that's missing is with the zeta case, you have this extra term. And so the sum of these, this is not an infinite, this is not a finite series. You've got infinitely many of these terms, infinitely many of these terms, infinitely many of these terms, infinitely many of these terms. Um, and so the sum of these, including all of these terms, is equal to the sum of these, including all of these terms and all of these terms. So we have two sides calculated separately using the residue theorem on each side. And so what is going to happen is you're going to get the two residue sums have to be equal. And so if you add up the residues on both sides, this is from the zeta side, from the pole at 1, from the pole at the non-trivial zeros, from the double pole at minus b, and from the trivial zeros, is equal to, on the L function side, with the character chi, a sum from the zeros at its, the non-trivial zeros of the L function, and the uh, double pole at b, and then the trivial zeros. So you get a uh, big thing with a big thing. It looks like a big fat mess, but this term has no analog over here. Now, if you believe the Riemann hypothesis, What's the real part of rho? The real part of the rho chi, both one half. And so the magnitude of this, if you use the triangle inequality, the magnitude, you can pull out the magnitude of x to the rho or x to the rho chi, and the size of this is the square root of x, and the size of this is the square root of x, and that looks pretty small as a function of x. That looks small as a function of x. You know, x is at least 2. Um, that looks small as a function of x, small as a function of x, small as a function of x, small as a function of x. Size of something like the square root of x, something like the square root of x, x. Aha! So we get a kind of dichotomy. So if this thing is equal to this thing, then if we put this on one side and add this and this and this over to this side, then the whole right-hand side will have something roughly on the order of root x, and the left-hand side has something on the order of x. And if these things are really equal, then we should be able to get some kind of a bound. x can't be too big for these two expressions to be equal. And so if you put this on one side and put all of these terms on the other side and take absolute values, so you can replace these mysterious numbers by the square root of x, then you get the one term coming from the pole of zeta is at most root x times the sum plus the sum plus the sum plus the sum, and I put some bounds here. The log thing is at most one of the b. In any case, you get some expression here, and it's time to finally make a choice. What the heck is the number of b? You're going to take b to be a half. Okay? And so you just take b to be a half. So that's a half, that's a half, that's a half. Yeah. So you just, anyway, just get the whole thing over again. That was 1 plus b. 1 plus a half is 3 halves. You're welcome. Um, and so you get this expression here. Now look, that's an actual number. Okay? It doesn't depend on anything. That's just a number. These depend on the character. So, um, you know, you have to be a little bit careful in estimating them because you don't want your stuff to depend directly on the character. Um, the, this has nothing to do with anything. This has nothing to do with anything. These are just absolute numbers down here. here. So, um, but this depends on, this, this is actually just a single number. This is the subtle thing. This depends on the character. So, um, how do you find numbers at minus a half? You have to use the functional equation. In any case, um, I just want to mention briefly, how do you deal with these two sums? If you wanted to bound the sum of 1 over the zeros plus, actually, let me, let, me just, let me just do with the L function, okay? 
if you wanted to bound, excuse me, if you wanted to bound this thing, okay, um, what you do, like Christelle mentioned in her course, she mentioned an infinite product for the, uh, the uh, Carlitz exponential. So in complex analysis, you know, entire functions admit decompositions into infinite products over their zeros. Okay, but in complex analysis, we have to sometimes introduce exponential damping factors for the infinite product to converge and make sense. Um, in any case, if you write the completed L function as an infinite product over the zeros, uh, every zero has to appear here with its multiplicity, then um, if you're very careful taking logarithmic derivatives of the completed guy and logarithmic derivatives of this guy turns products into sums, you wind up getting a formula that gives you the sum over twice the real part plus one over the size of the zero plus a half squared. And the uh, pi over m in the completed guy, when you take log derivatives, gives you a log m over pi here. And so if these are all one half, two times a half plus one is two. And so you get a bound on the size of this is at most, if you do a little bit of math, you get a log m here. So here you get this term in that uh, equation from before is bounded in terms of the log of m. And so if you uh, carry that through in both cases, then you get your x over 9 fourths. So 4 ninths x is at most root x times something involving log m. And so if x is at least 1, you get a bound on x. And so there is your, I guess you could say, you know, 5.03 squared log m squared plus lower order stuff. And so you see that the x is at most some constant times log m squared. Okay? So Bach showed that you can actually take k equal to 2 by running through this argument much more carefully than I have. I kind of wasn't as attentive to some of the estimates, and I wound up with a slightly larger number on the order of 25. But if you're more careful, he got it down to 2. But you see that the whole idea is coefficients are equal over initial chunk. Any transform of the two things are going to be equal, and so you can extract out the initial coefficients, make them equal, and then you compute both sides of the residue theorem, and you have control over the location of the zeros, you're in good shape. And so the last thing I want to mention is, what if GRH was weakened? So maybe I don't know the zeros are all on line one half. Maybe I know the real part is at least away from the line one. Maybe it's at most one minus epsilon, okay? So this, this two here would turn into one over epsilon if the real part of the zeros were between one minus epsilon and epsilon. We hope, eps, you know, GRH tells us epsilon is a half, so one over a half, I think, is two. But even if you had a weaker version of GRH, as long as you don't know that GRH is a theorem, then you still get a polynomial bound in terms of log m. Okay? So anytime anybody ever says by GRH I can prove something, you should say, you know, first, what functions are you using it for? And if you don't know whether GRH is a theorem, you can say, what if you have this weaker form that you still get a similar result? Okay, because very often you do, but people don't write that in the papers. Okay, so thanks.